One of the things you might want to notice is more than half of the controllers in industry are PID controllers. <laughs> and although this is quite simple, all you do is you take the error signal and then magnify it, integrate it, take derivative of it, add them together and send it as the control signal to the plant. And uh, you might wonder why is this simple uh, control law or controller is so popular and used in so many places. Well, uh, so first let me, since I mentioned it, let me uh, emphasize it one more time for you here in a picture that uh, if you have your control system G, you can call this G of controller if you want. So you have your system, your plant, G, and then right behind it in series, you put the controller. And here, this controller receives the error signal, which is here is the output desired, or you can also show it by input. And then this is your feedback from the output. And the feedback can be directly sent back and subtracted, or it could be sensed. So there could be a sensor a transfer function H here. And this difference between the desired and actual output is what we call the error signal, right? So this uh, controller will get the error signal and then send a control signal UC to your system. And what is this UC? Well, if I show this error by E of T, and you, the control signal sending to the plants by UC of T, uh, the PID law is that UC of T is again like KP times the error. So we just magnify it. Also take a derivative from it and magnify it. So like KD times time derivative of this error. And then also another gain k sub i times integral of this error. And if you take Laplace of both sides of this PID control law, you're going to get your transfer function for PID controller, which is kp plus kds plus ki over s now. Uh, in many textbooks, they factor out kp and then the remainder this parameter here, for example, this TD is KD over KP. And then this KI and KP are also related to TI, right? So TI is KP over KI. And uh, they show it with this format as well. Clearly, you see this transfer function has one pole at zero, and then it has a quadratic term in the numerator. So it has two zeros and a pole. So by itself, it's not a causal system, of course, but uh, that's what we have here as the PID controller transfer function. And this KP, KD, and KI, we call them the gains or the parameters of the PID controller that we can change and tune. And uh, by changing them and getting the response type of response that I desire, then that's changing the game to reach the goals, the desired outcome, we call it game tuning or control tuning. Now, why is it that PID controller is uh, such a popular one? The most important thing is this. The PID controller does not need to know what is going on in your plant. All it takes, you give it some signal, it multiplies it by a number, take derivative, integrate, and add them together. It does not care what is going on in the system. All it needs is the difference between actual and desired outputs, which is called error. So this controller seems to be working for so many cases, actually without you really need to know what's going on in the system. Many other control laws that you might see later on in a graduate level course, like, uh, for example, we call a nonlinear, there is a nonlinear controller called feedback linearization, or uh, 
in adaptive control when you want to estimate the state or you want to have observers and so many other things, you need to know the mathematical model of G in order to come up with this control law. But here, you see, I don't care. All I need is I have these three parameters. I need to change them to get my desired output. And we learned that each one of them has a separate role, right? So the goal of the proportional part is when you pass the point that you want to be at, this proportional part would basically move you back toward the desired location. But since this uh, uh, proportional part alone will kick you back toward the desired point once you pass it and once you go again at the equilibrium point you don't or at the desired point you don't stop you keep moving because the system has momentum so you would pass it and now this time you would pass it in the opposite direction and again this will give you a, a force or a signal in the opposite direction of the error so it takes you back it's like a spring basically right if you have a mass and you want to put the mass at a specific location and that mass is attached to a spring if you give the system some initial uh, displacement and then like one meter from equilibrium and then say hey finally you end up at equilibrium go back to where we started and uh, let the system go it is never gonna stop at the equilibrium why because whenever the system wants to stop at the equilibrium it has momentum so it passes it and whenever it passes the spring tries to push it back but because there is no damping in the system it keeps oscillating so to add the damping we add the derivative term the derivative term makes the system faster make it have the predictabilities and uh, you can be, uh, act and move based on the trend in the error not only you care about the current value of error you care also how this error was changing over time and so PD actually will not oscillate much like KP and will ultimately damp uh, and settle on some uh, number. Now, whether that number is exactly the number that you want it, if it is, then we say there is no steady state error. If it is not, then there is a steady state error. And sometimes the PD controller, PND only, cannot eliminate that steady state error because there are some hidden factors inside the system friction and so many other things that even though your system is settled at a specific value and e dot is zero and e is a very small number so the total of pd part is not gonna produce a huge force to eliminate that uh, steady state error. And that's where you look at the history of the error, which was not always a small, and use that integral, right? The history background, and use that to push the system more toward equilibrium, of course. So Ki helps with eliminating or reducing the steady state error, but as it adds one to the order of the system and moves the root locus, it makes system a little slower and also more unstable or reduces the stability. So we have to pay attention to how much of each one of these gains we are using to get a desired output. So one of the first questions you might ask is, okay, how do I do that? If somebody gives me an example like this, so I have a plant like one over uh, S times S plus one times S plus five and see, you tune a PID controller for it so that it gives me some specific uh, performance uh, characteristics, right? So much of rise time, so much of overshoot, this and that. How would you uh, really set these three parameters, KP, KD, and KI, or KP, TD, and TI? How would you do it? Well, there are so many different methods in the literature for doing that. Analytical, um, they're all analytical, but some of them might end up with optimized and the best type of parameter values, which are suggested in your textbook as computational optimization. Or there are some more intuitive methods, 
like the Ziegler Nichols, which Ziegler Nichols is both described in the S domain and then in the frequency domain. And the simplest one is, of course, in the S domain that we're going to go over. And I'll show you what's the idea of Ziegler Nichols. And then we're going to solve a problem for it on the paper. And then I'll show you how to do all of that in the MATLAB Control System Designer toolbox or GUI. So the Ziegler Nichols says this. First, turn the derivative and integral part off. Okay, TI infinity means what? Means this term is zero, TD is zero means this term is zero. So in other words, it says in the beginning, only use a proportional controller and increase KP until you see the system starts oscillating, right? So basically it means in that mass spring system, make the spring powerful enough that it can exchange energy, potential energy with kinetic energy and bring the system back. Okay, because not always this uh, KP alone has enough power, enough juice to bring the system back when you disturb it, correct? Not always you have that much of uh, signal you see to force the system back when you're off the equilibrium, correct? Or the desired location. So first it says magnify the error because that's all the proportional does. Magnify the error, make it bigger, bigger, bigger until you see, hey, now whenever my system passes or it is out of the equilibrium or the uh, what we call the desired position, when it's not at that, then this controller can provide enough of signal, big enough, to push it back toward the desired position. When that happens, as I told you, it pushes the system back toward the desired, but when you get to the desired, the system will not stay there. Because of momentum, it will pass it in the opposite direction now, and now because the proportional has enough of power, it brings it now in the opposite direction back toward the desired location. But again, when it reaches the desired, it has momentum, it passes, and you see the system starts exhibiting sustained oscillations. That's where you know that my KP is probably enough. The proportional part is doing its job, but it cannot kill the oscillations. That's where you have to bring in derivative component. So, as I said, the uh, KP at some points makes the system show sustained oscillation. That value, that threshold for KP, we call it KCR, okay, the critical K value. And when the system output shows the sustained oscillation, the period of that oscillation, we also show it by P sub. See, you have to measure both KCR and PCR experimentally, okay? Now, the Ziegler-Nichols method, uh, method says, if uh, you want to have a P controller, a PI or a PID controller, you see, it does not suggest PD because if you don't use D in combination with I and just use PD, then if your input has noise, that D component alone will basically magnify the noise beyond the point you can control. So if you want to use D, use some I as well, so that I basically first smoothen out the noise of the input, then take a derivative of that. Or there is another version that you, the derivative that you do is not a simple derivative, it's a derivative with a filter that I show you in a few slides from now. But uh, let's right now just focus on PID, the most complete version. And it says, well, if you know now KCR and PCR experimentally, then you go and bring your KP back to 0.6 of that KCR, set your TI to 0.5 of the PCR, and TD to 0.125 of PCR, okay? So the final form of your PID controller in terms of these two critical values that you measure experimentally will be this one that you can see here, if you simplify it. 0 0.075 KCR PCR times S plus 4 over PCR squared divided by S. 
as I said, numerator of it is a quadratic term. Denominator is just a pull at zero, right? So now to clarify how this method works, I want to go through this example with you and we design a PID controller for this system. Now, one thing I do here for you is instead of me starting with a PID and change P from a KP from zero to some KCR so that ultimately it shows oscillation, I want to show you if I know the system model. Remember that? The good thing about PID is you don't need to know the system model, okay? And so you do it experimentally. But what if I do have the model of the system? Can I find PCR and KCR analytically instead of experimentally? And the answer is yes. When your system is a simple linear system like this, you can even do it analytically. There is no need to keep doing a trial and error until you get those numbers. So let me show you exactly if you want to do it when you have the model of the system analytically, how you would do it. So this is what you do. So remember that your uh, system in the beginning is only KP, right? You say first, just use KP, no derivative or integral portion. And the actual physical system is S times S plus 1 times S plus 5, right? And then there is no feedback transfer function. So if you multiply G by GC, correct? So if I say GC times G, it is going to be KP over this one, right? And what is the closed loop transfer function? If you remember... The closed loop transfer function C L T F, correct? Which is the output Laplace over input Laplace. It is equal to what? This guy here divided by one plus this one times h, of course, right? And remember that h in our case is 1. It's a unity feedback system. So the signal coming in is u, and then this is gc, and this is g, and this is h in general, but h in our case is 1. So since this is 1, if I simplify, I can get it is going to be equal to KP divided by now product of all this, which is S cubed plus uh, 6S squared plus 5S plus KP. So this is the closed loop transfer function that I should be focusing on. Now, let's see if you still remember from our previous lectures, what is the characteristic polynomial? Yes, you're right. The characteristic polynomial is the denominator of your transfer function, right? So this one here. And how can I tell whether for a specific value of this KP, the system has any roots on the right-hand side of the imaginary axis, which means it is unstable. How can I say whether it has any roots on the imaginary axis? So it shows sustained oscillation, which is what we are after, and so on. What method did we use? Correct. It is called the root stability method, right? And the root stability method says we are going to form a table where here is s cubed, this is s squared, this is s to the 1, and this is s to the 0. And then for the first row, we use the coefficient of s cubed, and then we jump every other term, we write down the coefficient. So it's 1, then this is 5. In front of s squared, we have 6, and then we have the constant kp, right? And then when I want to calculate S1, it's going to be 6 times 5 minus 1 times KP divided by 6. So it is going to be 30 minus KP and then divided by 6. This one we don't have. We 
just plug in a zero and now if you simplify multiply these two minus six times zero divided by that you're going to get eight kp correct and then we learn that if we want the system to be stable in other words all of the roots of the characteristic polynomial to be on the left side of the imaginary axis what should we do yes there should be no sign change in the first column the first two elements of the first column are positive so should the other two last elements be so this guy should be positive and this guy should be positive if we want all the roots on the left hand side correct so what does it mean it means kp should be bigger than zero and of course you see less than 30 right so this is the stability condition this is the stability range for parameter kp now let me ask you this uh, in this system, if we wanted to draw the root Lucas, right? In this system, if we wanted to draw the root Lucas, what should we do? This is the function for which uh, we have to draw the root Lucas. And we can do it. Of course, it has three poles at 0, negative 1, negative 5. There is uh, no 0 in this open loop transfer function. Kp is the parameter that you can tune. And when we start at the poles, kp is zero and as we go toward the infinite zeros of this gcg then kp goes to infinity and the question is at what kp are we going to cross the imaginary axis let's see can you guess yes you are right it's this number here right once i am at 30 and then past 30 what happens once I pass 30, now this component will be negative while this one is still positive. So I have one sign change, or two actually, from positive to negative, negative to positive. And two sign change means two roots to the right hand side. And I, uh, the system is not stable. And when it's less than 30, everything is on the left side. So what happened at 30? Yes, at 30 I am basically intersecting the imaginary axis i'm going from stability to instability right so kp equal to 30 is the value that makes the system exhibit what sustain oscillation marginally stable so this number is what is that a uh, critical number right in your in lecture we show it with k critical so k critical for us is 30 and we can exactly show at 30 the system if you want i can experimentally show you in MATLAB at 30 if you plug in the system will exhibit a sustained oscillation right all you need is to look at the response of it and uh, well if you doubt it i can show you right now so uh let me very fast do it so let me clean up everything and then um, here. So we say uh, your system is a transfer function of 30 and then in the denominator I have 1, 6, 5 and 30, right? And now if I say, show me the step response of the system, look. There we go. Sustain oscillation, right? If I make it less than 30, like 29 or 28 or anything less than 30, what do you expect? Stability. Look. You see? I am going to settle ultimately at the final value of one that is the desired output or the input. So this is a stable. And if I make it 31, what do you expect? Yes, the oscillation would increase in magnitude instead of decrease or stay at the same. Look at that. You see? They are getting bigger and bigger and that's 10 to the 26. So 30 is exactly the critical number we were looking for. Okay, now that we found the critical gain, it's time to find the period of sustained oscillation at this gain. And so what we can do is, 
if we go back to our characteristic equation, which is s cubed plus 6, s squared plus 5, s plus kp, and kp is now 30, right? So let's write it. Our characteristic equation is... This one, and uh, as we said, right now there is sustained oscillation. So one of the roots of this characteristic equation should be a pure complex, pure imaginary, right? So one of the roots should be something like j times omega, right? Or j times sigma, or whatever you want to call it. No real parts, just pure imaginary. So if we plug in into this equation, of course, we are going to get negative j omega cubed, and then negative 6 omega squared, plus 5j omega, plus 30. This is equal to 0. And so now we have a real part, which is 30 minus 6 omega squared, 0. And then we have an imaginary part, which is negative omega cubed plus 5 omega. And 0, and clearly you see one of the roots is omega of 0, which is not of our interest. But if you solve from either of these, you can see that omega is plus or minus uh, square root 5. Okay, so this is... Uh, that frequency, right? This is that omega, the frequency of that oscillation in radians per second. That's where the root is on the imaginary axis, correct? If you remember, if one of the roots of the characteristic polynomial is j omega or negative j omega, in general we have both of them, complete conjugates, then the corresponding solution to plus minus j omega is what? It is a harmonic, like A times sine of omega T plus some phase, right? So this omega is the frequency of that sustained oscillation, but now we are looking into the period of that oscillation. And period is, of course, you know, it's 2 pi divided by omega, and so it is going to be 2 pi divided by square root 5. So this is our period of the oscillation and the k critical if you remember it was how much it was 30 so i found both of these numbers that if i don't have the physical model of the system i can find these numbers by experiment but now i can do it analytically because i have the model of the system Good, so I got both of these numbers, and now this method says, now that you found them, now say Kp is what? 0.6 of Kcr, right? And again, remember Kcr was 30, so 0.6 times 30, right? So our Kp gain, it is going to be 18, correct? Which is 0.6 times 30. Then we have 0.5 PCR is TI. So our TI is going to be 0.5 of PCR, and PCR was 2 pi over square root 5, so divided it's going to be pi over square root 5. And then TD was 0.125, right? An eighth of PCR, right? Or one fourth of TI. So this is gonna be pi over four times the square root five. So these are the gains down that now I can plug into basically this formula, or I can directly go to the final formula, which is this one. 0 0.075 KCR PCR, and then that formula. So I can use either one, right? And if I do so, then I can find that my controller, GC, 
it is going to be okay it seems like i need to maximize it so that i can write on it again and um so gc of s then it is going to be 6.32 times s plus 1.42 squared the whole thing divided by s okay so that is my controller and now this controller this transfer function will be multiplied by the original transfer function to get my open loop transfer function and then I can look at the behavior of that right or I can find the closed loop transfer function and then I can look at the step behavior of that it should not show sustained oscillation and hopefully it does not show uh, much of a steady state error right so let's simulate that in MATLAB very fast so uh, I'm gonna go back to MATLAB and I guess I have sys so say g is the same as sys which is the only difference I wanted 30 right and first let's just go with the original one so it was 1 over s times, so this one should be 0, right? So this is the g, so g is equal to sys. And now I say gc is the transfer function of, and if you look at gc again, based on what I wrote for you, it is going to be something in the denominator and in the numerator, and in the denominator you have only s, which is 1 and 0. And the numerator was 6.32 times s squared plus 2 times 6.32 times 1.42 and then 6.32 times 1.42 squared. Okay, no, this one. So that is our transfer function. So now the open loop transfer function, if I call it gh or g new, doesn't matter. This is equal to series of g and gc. And then the closed loop transfer function, if we call it g closed loop this is equal to feedback of this g new and one right because h is one so that is my feedback or g over one plus g h so this is the final closed loop transfer function and now if i look at the step of this guy there we go you can see that the step does not show sustain oscillation, it's a damp oscillation and there is no steady state error. I am going to settle at uh, the final value. Now whether it's really what I need or not, I can modify these parameters. Probably you see it's showing about 60% overshoot, which might be too much. So I can probably change one of my parameters and improve this behavior right so bring this down probably make the system a little slower but i can bring down the overshoot right because if you remember overshoot was a function of zeta and zeta was a function of damping right it's called damping ratio so i can do that as well and uh, i can also get this step info right if you remember you can use the command step info and that will give me rise time, settling time, max overshoot, peak time, the peak value, and so on. So I can look at this, right?
So hopefully that makes sense for you. Now um, that we have seen how to basically design a simple PID controller with the Ziegler Nichols method. I want to mention a couple of things. First is PID controller with derivative filter, which we call it PIDF. So what it is, is the major part that we are changing is the derivative term. So the derivative can sometimes, although it is a really good thing, it makes system predict, uh, prediction capability and make the system more stable and faster, but it has some drawbacks. One of them is, what if the input to this controller, which can be input from the system, of course, minus output the error, what if it has a step type of behavior in it, right? So if the input to your system is a step, and let's say at the moment the output is just a constant number, zero or something, the difference between them still looks like a step function. And the question is, what is the derivative of the step function? Because one of these terms is a derivative. So the main question is, if I have this PID controller, or even a D controller, forget about PID, just the D portion. If I pass to it the unit step function, what comes out? If you remember from our first lectures, the derivative of the step function is what we called what? The Dirac delta function, right? Which was basically, if you remember, it was a huge spike at time zero and everywhere else value was zero the area under the curve was one and it was a huge spike like collision forces impacts and so on right so and this is not the type of thing that you want to get as the output of your controller and inject it into your system you don't want to give the system a control signal that looks like a shock Right? You don't want such a thing to be inserted into the system. So you do not like that to happen. So instead of directly taking the time derivative, you try to make it a little more tolerable by first applying a low pass filter to it. Okay, you first apply a low pass filter. If you remember, 1 over 1 plus TS in general, it was a low pass filter. So you first filter it out and then take a derivative. Or in other words, when you combine a low pass, uh, low pass filter and a time derivative, the result is called a what? A high pass filter. And I showed you a high pass filter, right? high pass filter is like a lead compensator so this is a high pass filter high pass filter acts quite similar to a derivative but much better right it is much better so if you pass the step to the high pass filter it's not going to give you back an impulse function it is going to give you basically an exponential decay like that very fast of course but it's not going to be an infinite spike. It is going to be some spike, but with small, much smaller magnitude, and then it gradually goes to zero, not all of a sudden, right? So instead of this extreme type of behavior, now, if I, so this is the time derivative. But if I pass it through this system, where it is like T1S divided by 1 plus T2S, a high pass filter, if I pass this signal to it, then the output, again, would look like much nicer and smoother type of exponential decay. And I can use that one. Still gives me predictability and fastness and everything, but it is not going to give me a huge output. That's one advantage. The uh, other advantage is if the input has noise. And you know, when you take derivative of noise, which is a fast changing signal, the output again is going to be big. 
So what the first portion of this filter does, it first do a low pass filter on it. So removes the fast changing portion of the signal, removes the noise, then takes derivative. So this is what is typically used in real life. Instead of direct D, we do a DF. We first do a low pass filter on it, then apply a D. Okay, so the PIDF, if I want to write it for you, so the for a PIDF controller, GC of S is like what? Like KP plus KI over S plus, now instead of KD times S, it is what? It is like KD times S, but divided by one plus another parameter, whatever you want to call it, over T times S, right? And this T, or T of filter, if you want to call it, this portion is, uh, you can write it as one times that, and this portion is your low pass filter, which is added on the top of the derivative. Okay, so this is, if you ever see that term, you know what it means. Now, finally, although this is not a formal part of our course, but I want you to learn that there is this amazing GUI graphical user interface in MATLAB called Control System Designer that you pass to it the open loop transfer function, G, and then it starts plotting everything that you need to know about it, and then you can use different methods for tuning a PID controller or designing a compensator. And then it shows the output of that in real time. And you can choose the type of uh, performance characteristics that you want. Do you want it to be faster, more robust, and so on? And then when it tunes it for you, then you can export the corresponding controller out to the workspace, okay? So I don't want it to be a cheating device, but I think it's a good idea that you at least see it. So this is what I want to do for you. And uh, first I come here and clear everything up. I define my controller, sys, and then I call the control system designer. And pay attention that uh, the letters, okay, S and D are big, capital letters. So there we go. Now I got my GUI. And this GUI shows for you basically the root Lucas for G. It shows you the body plot and it shows you the step response, right? You see the step response right now is not really good. It is quite slow. It takes about 20 seconds or more to settle down on the final value and it is over them. So you might go to under dam to make the system faster at the expense of having a little overshoot. Or you can move again the dominant poles from wherever they are to somewhere else. Right now they are at 0, negative 1 and negative 5. By the way, if you look at your body plot, you see that the phase margin is 76 degrees and uh, Let's see, your gain margin is 29 decibel. So in terms of stability, it is good, right? It is stable. In terms of the transient response, it is not. So one of the things you can do, you go here under tuning methods, you expand this, and then there are uh, graphical tunings that we learn about modifying the body, plot or anything else. What I want at the moment, this is the optimization method that I mentioned briefly. There is LQG, okay, linear quadratic Gaussian, which is for systems with uh, uncertainty in them. And I don't want to get into that right now. This is way beyond this course. So what I want you to click on is this PID tuning that you click, and then it brings this window for you. And now you can choose, first of all, what type of controller. Do you want PI, PIPD, or PID? So I want PID. 
and I also say I want to add a first order derivative filter. So I want PIDF controller. Then it says, how would you do, do you want to design it in time domain or in frequency domain? I keep the time domain. And then what is your timing method? Is it based on robust response time or classical design formulas? If you choose classicals, then you can choose basically so here you see that's the formula, the method, and you can go and then choose what? Ziegler and Nicole's step response. So this is exactly what we had in class. PID with derivative filter, Ziegler and Nicole's classic method, everything, right? And you don't need to do anything, just say update. And there we go. Now you see, this is the step response, just similar to what I did for you. And there is some overshoot, but it tuned it to the best it could. So it brought down the overshoot down to about 40% instead of 60. And now the settling time is better. It is a little faster. And if you look here, still gain margin is high, still phase margin is good, and uh, still the system behaves the way it should, okay? So now that it is updated, then you can go ahead and export this tuned controller to the workspace or you can see it if you want. So C, C is what? So you have a C here and you have a G. G is the original plant and C is your controller. So this is your controller. If you want it, this is your controller. Okay, the uh, tuned controller for this performance. You can also send this out to the workspace in terms of a transfer function. So you go to export and say export the tune blocks. By, can, by the way, you can also create a Simulink model out of this. So first uh, we click on tune block and uh, now uh, tune block. And then it says, what do you want? And I say, I want the controller and I export it. Now if I go to my uh, uh, worker space I can see this controller is exported here this sys is the same as G now the C is not a transfer function you see it's not a transfer function it's a ZPK a zero pole representation but if you want you can say my controller is TF of C converted from zero pole method the uh, displays uh, demonstration or representation converted into transfer function and there we go that's the same thing that you saw in that GUI right so now this GC is a transfer function and sys which is the same as G is another transfer function right so now you can reproduce all of those stuff again here in MATLAB 